you are about to embark on a great adventure that pits heroes against giants bent on reshaping the world. Hi, I'm Alex, and today we're going to be talking about Storm King's Thunder, a 5th edition D&D adventure. The purpose of this video is to provide players and dungeon masters with a brief overview of the campaign without spoilers, and then to provide dungeon masters with a synopsis of the adventure. The goal is to see if this adventure is right for your playgroup, and to show you some of the cooler parts of the adventure in my opinion, and to highlight some of the weaker areas that could use some improvement as well. The adventure recommends four to six players. From start to finish, the adventure takes you from levels one to 10. If you skip the first chapter, then you start at level five. Perhaps you did Lost Minds of Fandover or another adventure. Also, it is possible to reach level 12 with the characters if you explore all of the content that the campaign has to offer. This campaign can go long, six months to a year easily, especially with optional content that I would highly recommend from the Dungeon Masters Guild, which I will talk about later in the video. The adventure takes place on the Sword Coast, specifically the Savage Frontier, which is also known as the North, which is a cold, rugged, sparsely populated land of snow-capped mountains, rocky hills, sprawling forests, and foggy vales. There's isolated strongholds, ancient burial mounds, and ruins of many forgotten empires that dot the vast landscape of the North. The Savage Frontier extends as far north as the Icewind Dale and as far south as the town of Daggerford, Old roads stretch across this great expanse, towns and cities separated by dozens, if not hundreds of miles of untamed wilderness, hunted by bandits, barbarians, and monsters. But now, in the past couple of months, giants of every kind have emerged from their strongholds in force to threaten civilization as never before. Reports of giant attacks throughout the north have reached coastal cities of Luskin, Neverwinter, and Waterdeep. Giants are almost as old as dragons, which were still young when the giants' heavy feet first shook the foundations of the world, and they spread across the new lands. In the ancient times, giants and dragons fought bitter generational wars that nearly brought both of the races to their end. This ancient war dwindled their populations so much that small folk were able to flourish and regular civilization began. As a player, you can expect to find great wealth and glory as you battle giants and various creatures across the north. Check out the Sword Coast Adventures Guide for additional backgrounds and insights for your character that you create. Characters of all races and backgrounds would be welcome in the north. There are many strange individuals that walk the streets of all of the major cities. Some tips for character classes. Keep in mind that enemies will be giants. Spells that target wisdom or dexterity are strong while spells that offer strength or constitution saves are less helpful. Durable characters are good. The Barbarian is a very powerful class in this campaign. You don't need a magic weapon necessarily to fight giants. If you have a crazy polearm battle master build or another uncommon weapon you want to use, now is the time. This campaign was made for the Giant Killer Ranger, not only because giants, but due to the large amount of wilderness exploration itself. In combat healing is mostly useless other than to pick up your fallen teammates. Healing word is your best friend's campaign. And finally, a stealthy party can be very helpful or a character that has passed without trace. You can also speak with your dungeon master and have your background include being a member of one of the factions that are very prominent in the Forgotten Realms. This would include the Harpers, a group of spellcasters and spies who covertly oppose the abuse of power, magical or otherwise. They work alone or in small cells, gather information throughout Faerun, they discern political dynamics within each region, and then they help the weak, poor, and the oppressed, acting openly only as a last resort. The Lord's Alliance. Various settlements of the North have banded together to form the Lord's Alliance, a shaky coalition that proactively eliminates threats to their mutual safety and prosperity. Alliance leaders are often quarrelsome, while their operatives seek honor and glory for themselves and their respective lords. The Emerald Enclave, a group of wilderness survivalists who preserve the natural order by rooting out unnatural threats. They struggle to keep civilization and the wilderness from destroying each other, and they help others survive the natural perils of the savage frontier. The Order of the Gauntlet, whose members seek to protect others from evildoers, placing their faith in deities such as Torm, Helm, and Tyr. They bring strength to their faith, their hearts, and their weapons to bear against villainy. And the Jantarum, also known as the Black Network, is a shadow network that seeks to expand its influence and power base throughout the North. Its members crave wealth and personal power, 
though the public face of the organization appears much more benign, offering the best mercenaries money can buy. So if you want to take on some of the strongest stat blocks that the Monster Manual has to offer and visit some of the most high fantasy settings in 5th edition D&D, then look no further than Storm King's Thunder. The remainder of this video contains potential spoilers for the adventure, but if you're a DM or you've run the adventure before, please continue watching for some session zero tips and a more detailed look at the adventure synopsis. This is the final warning, spoilers ahead. Okay, let's get into what makes this adventure tick and talk about my personal favorite parts of running it. But first things first, we need to talk about the ordning. Giant society is defined in large part by the ordning. It's a caste system imposed upon the giants by the greatest of their gods, Anum the All-Father. The ordning determines where a giant stands among his or her ilk. Traditionally, storm giants have stood at the top of the ordning. Tall and powerful, they struggle to keep the weaker races of giants from despoiling the realms of the small folk and sparking conflict. The greatest storm giants are powerful seers, skilled at identifying and interpreting cosmic signs and divine omens. The aloof and aristocratic cloud giants one step below the storm giants, rarely interact with lesser giants or small folk. Extravagance defines their culture and their place in the ordning. Below them are the warmongering fire giants and the merciless predatory frost giants. Fire giants rank themselves by their forging skill, whereas frost giants rank themselves by their martial prowess. Near the bottom of the Ordning are the xenophobic stone giants, who mostly live underground. They regard the surface world as a realm of dreams. How well they sculpt stone determines their place among their peers. The lowest and smallest of the true giants are the hill giants, as gluttonous as they are loathsome. Hill giants are dullards, who live in fear of their more powerful giant cousins. In hill giant society, the biggest rule. So, the conflict in Storm King's Thunder begins when Anum the Allfather suddenly shatters the Ordning, pitting the six giant types against one another while keeping some semblance of order within each type. By doing this, Anum has spurred Cloud, Fire, Frost, Stone, and Hill Giants to challenge the established hierarchy and reforge their destiny. All the giants sensed the upheaval instantly and now the giant types fiercely compete against one another, striving to create a new ordning through their deeds and accomplishments. These giants' calamitous endeavors have not only put the settlements of humans and other small folk in jeopardy, but also attracted the attention of the giants' ancient enemies, the dragons, who will not abide to the rise of another giant empire. Small folk can only speculate as the cause of the giants' unrest. It remains to be seen whether the old ordning between the giant types will be restored or whether a new hierarchy will replace the old one, knocking the storm giants from their lofty perch. In this adventure, the player's aim is to see the storm giants restored to the top, as that would provide stability to the land once again and would cause the giant attacks to end. However, this goal is beyond the understanding of the players until partway into the adventure. More on that later. Prior to the shattering of the ordning, King Hecaton was arguably the most powerful of all storm giants. From Maelstrom, his citadel deep within the trackless sea, he presided over a court that included representatives from every race of giant, from the mighty storm giants to the lowly hill giants. With the power of the Worm Skull Throne, a gift given to him by his wife to keep more unruly giants in line. For as long as Hecaton had reigned, fear of the king's wrath and respect for the Ordning was enough to keep lesser giants from rising up against him. But in recent years, King Hecaton has become convinced that the age of giants was past, as evidenced by the growing distance between the giants and their gods. On the Allfather didn't answer prayers, and his divine offspring, the lesser giant gods, were out of touch, constantly waging war on one another on the outer plains. Hecaton came to believe that the giants were no longer the rightful masters of the world. Then, several months ago, Hecaton's fear became a reality when the Ordning was shattered by Anum the Allfather. The king was profoundly shaken by the realization that the storm giants might lose their apex status among giants. 
In the aftermath of the upheaval, he did his utmost to hold his court together, bullying weaker giants into submission. Hecaton's wife, Queen Neri, was particularly fond of the small folk. She visited them often in the years before the ordning was sundered, rising up out of the sea to meet them on the shores of the Sword Coast. Neri urged her husband to respect the civilizations of the small folk and leave them alone if he could not form alliances with them. But Hecaton, inherently distrustful of the small folk, wanted nothing to do with them. Neri continued to visit the small folk from time to time, even after the upheaval, until the day came when she failed to return from one of her trips. Hecaton's younger brother found Neri's corpse shortly thereafter on a small island, where she had been known to meet with humans. It was clear that she had been killed by small folk. Sarissa, the king's youngest daughter, shared her mother's affection for the small folk and stood next in line to inherit the Worm Skull throne. She urged her father to uncover the truth before lashing out at anyone he encountered. Hecaton was swayed by his daughter's level-headedness and wisdom, and he set out to learn how his wife had met her end. Unfortunately for the king, he was blind to enemies not only in his court, but also in his family. In fact, the seeds of discontent in Hecaton's family were planted over a year before the ordning was shattered, when the king decided that his two eldest daughters, Mirren and Nim, were unfit to rule. And he saw signs that pointed to Sarissa, his youngest daughter, as his most worthy successor. Mirren was tempestuous and prone to emotional outbursts, while Nim was the opposite, as cold and unloving as the sea. While Hecaton adored them both, he doubted their ability to keep the lesser giants in line, so he named Sarissa as his heir apparent. Mirren and Nim abided by his decision, but secretly they blamed their mother for persuading their father to pass them over. Mirren and Nim seethed inside, but were too terrified of their father to do anything, until a recent arrival to Maelstrom named Imrith wormed her way into Hecaton's court and goaded them into action. The elder sisters, acting in accordance with Imrith's counsel, are responsible for both Neri's death and Hecaton's disappearance. Mirren and Nim got their revenge against Neri, with Imrith's help to have her assassinated. Then they urged their father to hunt down the small folk who killed their mother and fed him false information on the whereabouts of the assassins, to throw the king off track and to put him in peril. In the wake of Hecaton's disappearance, disorder has engulfed his court. After nearly a month of waiting for him to come back, Sarissa reluctantly claimed her father's throne. Sarissa values the counsel of her advisors, but she has her own mind. She wants to see her faith and her mother's faith in the small folk vindicated. So she leaps at any opportunity to use the small folk to find her father, who she correctly believes has the power to set things right. She's hoping for a cosmic sign to validate her beliefs, but time is not on her side. And unknown to her, Imrith is actually an ancient blue dragon in disguise who can assume the form of a storm giant. In this guise, she has infiltrated Hecaton's court while concealing her true nature and agenda from the giants, with the ultimate goal of thrusting the giants into war with the small folk. The disguised dragon put Mirren and Nim in direct contact with representatives of Slark Rathrell, a legendary kraken that haunts the trackless sea. These small folk belong to a secret yet widespread organization known as the Kraken Society. Using the information given to them by the evil storm giant sisters, Kraken Society operatives ambushed and killed Queen Neri. Imrith then planted rumors in the storm giant's court that the queen had been assassinated by the Lord's Alliance. The Lord's Alliance represents one of the greatest threats to dragons in Veyrune, so Imrith is keen to bring about its end. If it isn't clear at this point, the big bad evil guy of Storm King's Thunder is the ancient blue dragon, Emrith. In fact, here she is, hiding in the background on the cover. I bet you didn't even notice her there. Convinced that Hecaton is dead or otherwise out of the picture, five giant lords have struck out into the world to reshape the ordering through their own deeds, each hoping to be elevated by the gods to the pinnacle of giant kind. The adventure begins with chapter one at the fortified village of Nightstone, shortly after a cloud giant attack. After securing the settlement, the characters locate several missing villagers in a monster-infested cave complex north of the village. This chapter concludes with the characters rescuing the villagers and gaining a quest 
that leads them to one of three locations, Bryn Shander, Goldenfields, or Tribor. In Chapter 2, the characters defend the Chosen City against a giant attack. Quests gained at the end of the battle prompt them to then explore more of the Savage Frontier in Chapter 3. Characters will then eventually come across a friendly giant, the legendary Frost Giant adventurer Harshnag. When the players meet Harshnag, is when the adventure really starts to find its footing. In Chapter 4, Harshnag leads the characters to a temple under the spine of the world, wherein they consult with a divine oracle. If the adventurers complete the oracle's quest, it tells them what must be done to end the giant threat. As the characters leave the temple for the last time, Imrith finally appears and attacks them. Harshnag boldly holds the ancient blue dragon at bay while the adventurers escape. This is easily one of the most cinematic fights I have ever run as a dungeon master. Harshnag's sacrifice is something both my player groups still talk about, and he is one of the most beloved NPCs of any adventure. Chapters 5 through 9 describe the lairs of the five giant lords threatening the north. Players choose which giant lord they wish to confront. The villain has a conch of teleportation that the characters need to reach Maelstrom, a storm giant stronghold, in the depths of the trackless sea. Chapter 10 describes the politically charged court of the Storm Giants and the challenges faced by its current ruler mentioned earlier, Princess Sarissa. If the characters earn Sarissa's trust, she tasks them with finding her father, King Hecaton. The search for Hecaton is handled in Chapter 11. After rescuing Hecaton, the Storm Giants are happy to let the characters deal with the remaining evil giant lords as they see fit. In fact, the players gain an additional level for each two they defeat beyond the first. When the players are ready, Hecaton joins forces with the party to slay the evil dragon Imrith in Chapter 12. Once Imrith has been defeated, the players have essentially beaten the campaign. If Hecaton survives this final battle, he reclaims his throne. Otherwise, his daughter Sarissa becomes queen. In either event, the storm giants forge an alliance with small folk against the enemies of giant kind, dragons. This act might be enough to restore the Ordning as it was, or the future of the Ordning might remain an open question in your campaign. So Wizards of the Coast leave the important decision making to the DM as usual. Storm King's Thunder is not a ticking clock adventure, meaning that the characters are under no pressure to end the giant threat quickly. The plots of the giant lords take months to unfold, giving the characters time to explore the north, travel from place to place, and entertain distractions. Some players might feel a sense of urgency to stick to the main storyline as much as possible, missing out on many elements of the adventure. Others might be willing to follow loose threads and stray away from the main story, hoping to take the adventure in interesting new directions. The adventure allows for a fair amount of wandering, especially in chapters 3 and 4. You have room to add your own quests or homebrew content. The North is very diverse, so almost any quest can be dropped somewhere in the world. I recommend Kraken's Gamble and The Flying Misfortune, both from the Dungeon Master's Guild. The former is an almost grim quest that brings the players in contact with the Kraken Society much earlier in the campaign. And the latter is a heist quest where the players are put in direct conflict with Imrith's two adult dragon children. Both quests are connected to the plot, but are not part of the original adventure. Wow, this video is getting way longer than I anticipated, but let's finally talk about what you might be here for. My opinion. What does Storm King's Thunder do right? Harshnag. Harshnag is an incredible NPC. He is strong, iconic, and has star power. He makes encounters easier to balance against other giants. He can soak damage if it becomes needed, and he can dish out as much as he can take. His backstory is compelling to the players, and he takes an active role in progressing the story. All of these traits make his sacrifice and potential death all the more satisfying. Strong stat blocks. Every crit from a giant makes the table silent. The constant threat of a TPK looms over the party during the early stages of this adventure. When the players finally gain the power to challenge the giants, they feel as if they have grown significantly. It is a satisfying power creep for both players and the DM. Open-ended. As said in the synopsis, there is a ton of room for modification to adding new content. The adventure is long, and it takes place over a vast landscape. Dotting the wilderness with random encounters and quests is entirely within the realm of reason. 
and having a rune suddenly unearthed in a place familiar to the players is not outside of ordinary. The setting. The lairs of each of the giant lords are unique locations that all bring a fresh perspective to the classic dungeon crawl. In this adventure, you can find yourself in a castle in the clouds, an ancient forge deep in the mountains, an iceberg fortress drifting through the sea, an impassable dark canyon filled with forgotten secrets, a seemingly impenetrable wooden den of goblinoid engineering, and more. So what does Storm King's Thunder not do so well? Combat adventure. There's only one real puzzle in the entire adventure, and Harshnag will tell the players the answer if they get stuck. You could also argue that questioning the oracle itself is also a puzzle, but again, Harshnag provides the answer if the players are stuck. Most of the conflict must be solved with combat. Some giant lords can be convinced to back down if threatened properly, but most must be dealt with lethally. Role-playing exists in this adventure. For example, the sequence of political turmoil with the Storm Giant's court. It just can be far in between the action. Missing maps. Some of the major cities and encounters do not have battle maps for each unique setting. The Roll20 version of the adventure offers a blank encounter map to use for these situations, which is bland after continued use. However, since this adventure takes place in towns that are featured in other stories and adventures, you can find a lot of free assets online for certain towns and areas. The Dungeon Master's Guild has even more optional content for Storm King's Thunder, which includes these missing maps, including maps for the three major locations in Chapter 2, which is one of the most apparent missing maps from the original adventure. Oversaturation. This is a strength and a fault of the adventure. Some DMs may be intimidated by the vastness and open-ended nature of Storm King's Thunder, and I completely agree. The descriptions for some locations leave something to be desired, and the world can seem empty if you don't take the time to fill it with things to do. It can also be difficult to make each town and location distinct and memorable since the players move around so often. That being said, there's a ton of content the book has to offer. You just have to ensure your players have the opportunity to do it. If things need to be moved because your players have been avoiding a section of the Explorable map, then make adjustments. You can always have the adventure come to the players rather than them seek it out. Lack of direction. Kind of an extension of the previous point, this adventure makes little to no attempt to clue the players into what is happening in the giant society. Without modifications, the BBEG of the adventure does not show herself until chapter 4, after the players have already confronted the Divine Oracle, giving them no opportunity to question the Oracle about Emrith. The first half of this adventure has the real possibility of going completely off the rails. Without NPC or DM just flat out telling the players what they should be doing, the adventure struggles to give the players any sort of direction, until they meet Harshnag. I do believe that the intention of the adventure is to just wander around the north, until you gain enough power to actually stop the giants that are ramping about while learning about the effects the giants have had on the civilizations of the small folk. New players especially can be confused about what they should be doing, or why they are doing a particular thing to begin with. Some players arrive at the Oracle with no ideas as to what they should be asking. Many players believe the intent is to overthrow the Storm King, or that somehow the Storm Giants are meant to be the final villains. While this perspective is good to have at first, after they meet Harshnag, the players should hopefully learn the truth. As written, the players may not even discover the truth behind Imrith's treachery until after rescuing Hecaton. And at that point, Imrith should be long gone, having fled to her lair, which removes a very interesting encounter when confronting her in Maelstrom. Overall, I would recommend picking and choosing a few moments early to introduce Imrith, the Ordning, and King Hecaton's court. All that being said, all of the tools for a good adventure are there. Overall, I would highly recommend this adventure. At least give it a read, or you can show it to your group and see what they think. I hope you have a better understanding of what to expect from Storm King's Thunder. I have plans to make a video for each chapter in the campaign. Consider this the video for Chapter Zero. Please be sure to check back for those videos for more tips and my experience running the